Just to give you a little bit of background about what to expect today, the sessions involve about 20 minute chat time, so we're going to talk for 20 minutes and then we're actually going to do your, your session. The, the most important part is actually changing the way the brain thinks, feels, behaves and responds. We're going to work together for eight weeks. I'm going to be your personal coach for that eight weeks. The goal would be is to really calm your brain down and actually get you into a pace of being neutral so you can cope with it. Have you been to other therapy before in the past? I've been to psychologists a few times, a counsellor a few times. How'd you find that? Not so good, really. I didn't like going over it, over it again. Okay. okay. Yeah. To be honest, for a while there, I thought I was cursed. <laughs> I literally felt like anyone that I was close to was gonna die. We'd moved away from Perth because my brother had been sexually abused as a child at the kindergarten he was attending. Then my dad was in a car accident. He couldn't go to work anymore. Uh, he became addicted to morphine. He brought a lot of guns and stuff into the house. My dad had stuck the gun behind him and as he pulled it out, it accidentally went off and hit Luke as he was running up the driveway. He got shot with a 357, which is like one of the most powerful handguns in the world. It was mercury tipped bullet as well, so he was mercury poisoned. He was only 19. It was like a good couple of years of him recovering in and out of intensive care in a hospital and stuff. This took a massive toll on his mental health. I started using drugs at about 15, like heavy drugs, so um, I didn't really stop to think about anything. I was working at the courier and I was on my way to work and my brother Luke called me and he just found our eldest brother Jason dead in the lounge room from a heroin overdose. <laughs> yeah. Right. After Jason died he um he lost his mind, he started to lose his mind and he went to his best friend's house and he hung himself. Me and my dad were the first family members there, so yeah, horrific. My first day back at work, nine days after Luke's funeral, I had a really busy day making a delivery near a school somewhere and like something just hit my window and when I got out of the van, it was a mother and a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Her head actually smashed the windscreen. The four-year-old was just laying in the middle of the road, just laying there, like, bleeding really badly from the head. Like, I thought I killed her, to be honest. But, yeah. And then my dad started losing his mind from the morphine. He was staying at my nana's. He accidentally overdosed on morphine. I didn't actually find out that he'd, he'd died until a few days after. I was shattered. I was so shattered because... <laughs> Sorry. Um, me and my mum had just spoke the weeks before about talking to Dad about, you know, what he had, was happening to him and coming off the morphine. And it was just me and mum for a really long time, but her health was going downhill. And then on my son's fifth birthday, she was supposed to meet me at my house with his birthday cake when I got home. 
I got home and she wasn't there and I thought I had to pick up my partner from work later on so I thought I'll just when I pick up Greg I'll go past and just say oh what's happened you know uh, so I picked up Greg from the train station and we went past her house and no, no one answered the door so I went round the back and so I got Greg to rip the fly screen off and as soon as I put my hand through the window I felt her there and God, you know she's gone and our son was in the car at the front of so I sort of said to Greg, just go take Isaac and just have his birthday. Everyone else was not coping so much that I didn't feel like I had time to... I hide everything really well. Like, I've learned to have this wall or this, like, fakeness of, like, not letting anyone see that there's anything wrong. You can't control your moods, you can't control your behaviour and you can't control your reactions. You're vulnerable. Yeah. We've got eight weeks of um, work together. Today's session is all about the technique that actually stops the brain from accessing that memory. Yeah. And so when you're triggered, it doesn't go back into that memory file. Do you feel anxious? Angry. Angry. Mm. Probably more at myself. You know, poor memory. Um, can't recall things, can't retain information. My father died when I was two and my mum married my stepfather when I was four. My stepfather was an incredibly controlling and dominating guy and the whole house lived in fear. My, my mum used to get beaten up on a fairly regular basis. Us kids, you know, it happened with us on a reasonably regular basis as well. And, you know, on one occasion I remember getting a backhander because I didn't uh, dry my glass when I rinsed it in the sink and he gave me a backhander and knocked me across the room and by the time I hit the ground I was getting a kick in the stomach. I jumped out the bathroom window and after coughing a broken nose and I walked the streets and next day I found myself a job working in a pet food place in Chilt Hill. From a young age, I always struggled with, I remember having suicidal thoughts at about eight or nine years old. Always struggled with not feeling like I belonged in this world. And so I became really, really angry and my way of dealing with it was to become angry and violent myself. I found what I thought was a solution, it was alcohol. It dulled the pain, it pushed everything down. Um, I didn't have to think or feel. I started doing arm robberies to support the habit. I went to jail when I was 19. And then I went to jail again when I was 29. Um, when I got out, started drinking. And the next, I think it was about eight years, I drank and drugged uncontrollably. Lived on the street, lived in cars, lived in, a, in squats. Um, I hit, hit, hit rock bottom. I made the decision I was just gonna use until I died. I went to court, got three years in jail. Started working the program, Love Stay Clean since then. Um, it's now 21 and a half years and um, all through the 21 years of being clean I've struggled with depression, anxiety. I get triggered really easy back to childhood and it just eats me up. In the last three or four years it's got really bad and six months ago I, I put a rope over a tree in the house where I was living and, um, and I've had some really serious uh, thoughts of, of suicide, you know. I was in a road train. I was in one of my really bad states and there was another road train coming towards me. And um, I had some serious thoughts about driving my truck head on into and if I could have done it without hurting another person, I probably would have, you know. This stuff has wore me down over my life and I'm tired, you know. I'm tired of fighting my mind and um, fighting the feelings.
PTSD is a bitch. Military service, no question. Um, I think you can understand by the situations that they're in. Um, who you thought you were completely changes, and you have to continually fight to know who you were before the situation even happened. And everyone thinks that the PTSD is from getting blown up by an IED or that kind of situation. People don't understand it's the, it's the training and it's just how you function in society. It was actually someone really close to me. It was actually one of my family members, one of their partners. He was a combat Marine. Um, he'd knock down doors and do those kind of missions. Um, and what happened is, because I was weighed so heavily on his mind, um, got into a drug substance abuse, and any little thing that came up just sent him over the edge. And literally, he was late on a car payment, and they towed the car away, and because of that, he decided just to end his life because that situation just threw him over the edge, and he just couldn't cope. I think the best therapy, other than professional help, is people with PTSD helping other people. Um, so with this job, I'm helping people, um, but I still, you know, still need help. I, I still get professional help. Um, I still work on myself in terms of being better. Um, and I don't think I'll, I'll never be back to who I was. 2010, our ship was called to set up the landing crew. Um, I was called to do a medical convoy with seven other individuals. And I just wasn't ready for the amount of mass death. My lieutenant you know, asked me if I knew what that smell was. And I said, no, and he said it was burning bodies. Um, so what we did is we told the Haitians not to, you know, burn the bodies. So they started throwing them in the water and we had to take those bodies out of the water and put them in body bags. So I was going to see my girlfriend and literally there was a fire and it was that same type of smell that was in Haiti and uh, it just completely set me off. From there, I just went into psychosis essentially and I had a, about four months I was there um, just completely in my bedroom just trying to recover and make sense of the world. And that's just the nature of the beast. And it's getting that help to stabilize and to stay in that okay zone. I think you have to realize that you may not be the person you were before the event that caused the PTSD. Um, I think that's the toughest thing. I think a lot of people fight to be happy or fight to be who they used to be. And I think that would be the best advice I would say what an individual can do is accept it and make light of it. Be positive about it and, and make that change. Sorry. Hello, Gavin. Hi. You ready for your session today? Yeah, yeah, ready now. Yeah. Just tell me a little bit about how you're feeling. How you been feeling over the last week? Um, it goes up and down. Wave of depression at the moment with my oh. children. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's one of those moments where I, I don't have a finish line. Okay. You got the situation with the family being over in New South Wales, and you're in Queensland. Tell me a little bit about how has being in Afghanistan impacted your mental health? Going through therapy, I realised that I, I probably had a bit of a breakdown mid-contact. Okay. Because my brain was overloaded with just too much uh, graphic content. Yep. Too many bodies, unexpected children. It doesn't take much before you've actually reached your limit and you go into that vulnerable state. And so it's an early warning sign that your brain's not coping. We've got to get you feeling good. We've got to get you um, living your life instead of contracting because at the moment your brain's so severely traumatised that you're in a state of contraction. Like still, still to this day, I... I sleep with a knife under my pillow and I go around and check all the doors and windows before I go to bed. Growing up in quite a, a severe, strict Christian household that had uh, fairly regular beatings from mum and dad, witnessing mum and dad constantly in uh, big arguments and punch-ups. It was very physical, like fights, bowls. I remember my mother picking up a chair and hitting my father with it. My mother being knocked to the ground. Seeing my older brothers trying to come in between my, my mother and father and it was just, it was, our house was turmoil. But it was, it was my house and I didn't really see any other houses so you don't really question it. I didn't question it. Anxiety and depression I've struggled with since I was early teen. I didn't know what it was back then. My parents would just say stop being stupid. Um, get over it. Being a parent myself and now being a person who started to replicate what I saw in my house, that's what uh, I've tried to explain it all away really 
um, saying, well, that's what my father taught me. That's what I saw in my house. But I'm a grown man. I'm an adult. Um, but I'm starting to realise that my upbringing has got a, a lot to do with the way I am now. I'm trying to fix those things through educating myself and learning how to be a better father and learning how to uh, discipline properly rather than uh, use fear and use um, force. Coming home after Afghanistan, seeing the I think I went into war a bit naive. <laughs> like, um, just not realizing what, what men can do to each other. When you start seeing dead children, like my wife used to say to me, where, where's the man I married? And I just started saying to her, he, he's dead. Like, you got me now. Like, that guy you married doesn't exist anymore. My wife and I went from having an argument to me losing control, smashing everything, throwing everything around the house, uh, threw something and it hit my wife. My daughter's starting to scream, Daddy, Daddy, stop it, stop it. And it ended up with them outside and me locked in the house and the police banging on the doors and me locking everything down and not wanting to go out. I went into hospital for about three months after that and then went through the court, but it didn't stop. I asked my wife to leave. Um, we'd been in and out of court. I was starting to get arrested on assault charges. Children were starting to pick up the phone and call the police. Um, it was time to do something different. I've been on these mental health drugs for coming up three years and I feel I feel 200% 300% worse horrible I'm just uh, I'm just a shadow of who I used to be and I know I don't know who that is on the other side I don't know who I'll end up being but it's got to be better than this Terry, I'm good. How are you? Come through. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. So a lot of people that I see, they may have had anxiety as a child, but as they got into adult life, they build up their confidence, they build up their self-worth. And then what actually happens is they get a trigger and that's when it raises its ugly head. I never really get to stop and enjoy a moment. Okay, okay. It's overthinking all the time. Yep. And stress can be performance stress. The way your brain responds to your 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 depression is by actually triggering off anxiety. So I think the trauma on the trauma, um, I've never quite gotten over it. As a child, I lived in a little bubble, which was created by my paternal grandmother. She was a Holocaust survivor in Auschwitz. She unfortunately lost a child and a husband. She was a very talented tailor, so she made all of the uniforms for the soldiers. That's how she kind of survived the Holocaust, I think. That was prior to her meeting my grandfather. So this was her life before. She wanted to shelter us from her trauma. I never really liked school or leaving my family or um, being away from my family. I never went to school camps, that sort of thing. I was very very anxious to be away from my family. So I became very obsessed with my studies and then I became very obsessed with my weight and body image. I was diagnosed with generalised anxiety and I was placed on medication and refused to take it. I wanted to prove that I was strong and didn't need any help. When my Nana passed away, that was quite traumatic in itself, watching her go through that. Then and I got married in 2017, in October. 
in April I was told that if I didn't start putting on weight, um, I wouldn't be able to carry a child. We were planning on doing some hormone treatment. Before I started the treatment, I miraculously fell pregnant. It was a very traumatic pregnancy. I was extremely unwell. At the end of that scan, the sonographer said, um, you have a very sick baby girl. In that moment, my heart broke into a million pieces. I never ever thought that someone could experience so much pain in, in a sentence, one simple sentence. You either wait the next two or three weeks for her to pass naturally on her own, or you decide to terminate the pregnancy now on your own. Probably the most traumatic part of it all was sitting down for about four hours with my husband trying to take the tablets that would terminate the pregnancy. The tablets need 48 hours for the baby to pass, um, which meant that I would be delivering her the day after my 30th birthday. The delivery in itself was horrific. It was a 22 hour labor. I said the next two or three weeks I was extremely unwell. And I saw a doctor who told me he thought I had something called Asherman syndrome, where basically you have a lot of scarring in your uterus after surgeries or trauma to the uterus, which causes you to not get periods and not carry children. I'm 31 years old and you're telling me I can't carry a child? My midwife, special friend, came to me at the age of 43 and said to me, I'm going to carry your child for you. She had the pressure of how precious this child was. She probably knew that I wouldn't be able to handle another loss. We got there. I still am desperate to carry a child myself and I have not stopped treatment since. I have major anxiety um, about pregnancies. Just freaks me out. Every issue, every anything, I automatically, my mind goes to the worst. It's a loss, it's a loss, it's a loss. I need to just get my head right. Essentially we aim to help people with a range of mental and emotional health problems get back to being their highest and best self. We help them to create an internal space that is calm and peaceful, um, which then helps them to operate from a space of love and compassion rather than fear. The proprietary technique works through positive auditory stimuli and it seeks to target the individual's unconscious brain in the aim of altering their current conscious self. So that's the way that they think, feel and behave today. And essentially this is because at the Brain Wellness Spa we believe that the individual's unconscious brain is where their problems and patterns of behaviour are created and where they're stored. Kelly, Grant, Gavin and Melissa are all currently going through their eight week program and like many individuals that have come before them, I'm very confident they're going to get great results. Look up to the sky and I got this relief inside Then there's no need to hide I'm going all the way up oh, I'm going all the way up oh, I'm letting go in my heart oh, Of everything that holds me down no, no. Feeling like a stranger
what a beautiful morning it is and the last eight weeks have just been absolutely mind-blowing transformation mentally for me. I feel lighter, I feel like I see a brighter future, you know, I feel like I'm looking into the future more. Within the first couple of weeks I noticed a shift in what I was willing to tolerate from other people. Um, I felt like I could more inclined to speak up for myself, which was awesome. Um, you know, I, would go, I would just discovered the whole um, idea of having boundaries, which was like, you know, exciting. Then about halfway through, I think was the first time in, I don't know, I would almost say ever that I actually experienced feeling content. Like, you know, I had such a great weekend i'd been going out i went out so many places with my son i had such a good time and i came home that night and i just felt content yeah really content we only five percent use that conscious mind so you know all of that stuff that's dug really in deep deeply ingrained in you that you don't even realize is why you're making feeling and thinking and behaving in, in certain ways that you know just for that background noise almost to shift into a different voice or a different way of thinking is just like amazing. Yeah, I, I feel a million percent from the last time we spoke. I stopped taking all my nighttime medication as well. I'm completely medication free at night. I've still got a little bit of depression and sadness because I'm not with my family. I don't think that's going to change until I'm reconnected with them. But uh, I'm much happier with my life. I'm enjoying where I'm living. I've gotten out into the community and there's a coffee shop that does live music Friday night and Sunday afternoon and I've met some people there and it's not only what Terry's doing with her therapy, it's how she's encouraging me and um, uh, almost um, coaching me back into the community. I noticed from the first session that um, it switched off all of those arguing voices in my head that were trying to constantly solve everything. It's helped me start to just live for today and plan for tomorrow but not worry too much into the future. The biggest thing is I haven't had any thoughts of suicide in that time, which is massive for me. The first four weeks I was trying to work it all out because it's, it's quite different what she does um, and, and the program and that. And so I was trying to work it all out and I was pretty sceptical. Um, but I can't deny how I feel. You know, you know, my scepticism can't push that to the side, you know. I feel like I'm starting to connect with myself and so that's pretty massive for me, you know. Yeah, it's really changed the way I'm, I'm thinking and, um, and feeling. So when I feel these feelings of anger, they don't get, they haven't been getting anywhere near as intense. Um, and I, it's almost like I've got a bit of control over it now. I've got confidence that no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay and I can get through it. Like every time you go and see a new psychologist or a new counsellor, you've got to go through the whole thing again. Whereas with this, you know, Terry has a brief out, outline and, and, you, and we just work, you just, she just works from that. So you don't have to dig it all up and go through it all again. And, and that's probably, so that's probably the best thing actually. You don't have to dredge through your whole past again. My PTSD was very silent. I kept it to myself a lot and a lot of the outside world wouldn't have known the way I was, but honestly, I just feel so, so much better. I feel like um, I'm like I'm becoming my old self again. And I did lose myself for quite a while um, and was in a pretty deep, dark place for some of it. And it's not fun and I think in that moment you don't realise how bad it is because it's all that you can get through at that time. And I fought through it. And you know, I thought I was, I was doing okay until this whole journey be um, begun with Terry and the Brain Wellness Bar. And now that I look back, I really was not coping. <laughs> I was surviving. I was surviving. Now I'm starting to live. For the first time in three, four years since this whole journey has begun, I think my excitement has overtaken my fear. And I feel like if and when 
My specialist tells me that I can carry a baby physically, mentally, I'm ready. I think we're at about 10 weeks now. Uh, the biggest difference is I'm out of my house every day. I'm starting to get some self-confidence back. I'm feeling much calmer. I'm actually feeling like I have a future. I'm starting to get away from thinking about my problems every day and starting to plan for what I want to come next. But uh, the more I get involved in the veterans community and see how many people are helping and seeing how many people have helped me, I'd love to, once I'm at a point where I feel stable and um, I can start moving forward, start giving back into the veterans community, start offering my journey as something to help others who are at a point where they don't know what to do. Just to be able to show them the pathway of how to get from where they are to where I am, to try and help them not give up turning people from considering suicide to smiling and happy and loving life in eight weeks. Well, eight weeks is nothing. I can't believe there's such a big change in eight weeks. Imagine 12 months from now. In the past, I've seen psychologists and been to counsellors and it never took me anywhere, you know? I never felt like it changed me at all. Well now I don't I don't even get frustrated anymore. Like I really don't. Like it's just so great. Like littlest things before used to really like set me off and now I can I feel like it's just like yeah well, that's alright, whatever. The one main change that I feel has happened is that I am not held back by my emotions anymore, by my past and I just don't feel burdened. Like, if you had to ask me eight weeks ago what, where my life was going to go or what it was going to be, I would have had no idea. I probably just would have told you negative things. But now I have so much clarity and I feel like I have a direction and I can see a future and it was so worth it. Who wouldn't want to walk into a place, be greeted by Terry, have a quick conversation about how my week's been, clear up a couple of things if that's what I need to do, and then close my eyes and fall asleep, and then eight weeks later, wake up feeling amazing. Why wouldn't I recommend it? But then the actual sessions, I don't know how they work, but there is definitely something almost miraculous that happens. Like before I started doing it, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't have bothered me if I dropped dead that day. Like in fact, I welcomed it. But now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be dead for quids. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. From the moment that we met You were the way Oh, this could be the best thing that I'll ever know the sun as it slowly crept from the horizon to the place we met oh this could be the best thing that i'll ever know
You literally walk in, close your eyes, put some beautiful music on, an eye mask and a blankie. <laughs> That's it. I mean, for me, there's no other treatment like it.